Well, let's say a big round of thanks to the learned owl who's in the back of the room selling the author's books. Immediately after this program, the author will be there signing. We'll also have some refreshments in the back, so you can visit and mingle and talk to him as well as others, hopefully, and he'll sign your books for you. Third of all, I want to thank you all for coming out on a cold, blustery November evening in Hudson, Ohio. However, I think that you will all be wonderfully rewarded. Um, Mr. Edward Ball, as you know, is with us tonight, and he came in from... Connecticut yet this evening and made the wonderful trip here. Um, so he has come to know Ohio and its rain. <laughs> you are going to get the opportunity to know him, but I will give you a couple of brief snippets. His family it was very significant in the southern part of the United States and dates very early in our country into the 1600s. Um, as some of you may know, he won the National Book Award a few years ago for his publication, Slaves in the Family. If you want to learn anything about his family and or his amazing research that went into this book, I highly recommend you read his book, Slaves in the Family. He came from Connecticut this evening, which is not his home state. He happens to teach writing at Yale. And he tells me that the students are a little pressured at the moment at Yale. They're in the midst of doing exams and papers and whatnot. But he has a break, so we're very grateful that he came to Ohio. His newest book, as you all know, is what attracted him to Hudson, Ohio this evening, The Inventor and the Tycoon. And he's going to present about that. I try not to tell you too much about the individual because I think they are the best person to tell you about them and their life and their research. So without further ado, and we will have questions afterwards, please welcome to Hudson, Ohio, Edward Ball. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Pleasure to be here. It's my first visit to Hudson, and it's such a beautiful place. And uh, and I uh, immediately arriving in town, thought to myself, this looks a lot like a town in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> and as it happens, Hudson has some roots in Connecticut. But I'm here today to tell you a story about two men who lived 150 years ago in California. An artist by the name of Edward Mybridge, a photographer, who took these photographs of himself swinging a pickaxe of the type that a railroad worker might have used in building a transcontinental line. You might see that Mr. Moybridge is naked here. He was not ashamed of photographing the nude body, his own body in particular. The other man is Leland Stanford, who was the president of the Central Pacific Railroad, which built half of the transcontinental track. He's standing in the middle, holding up a, a mall, as it's called, a hammer of the type used by the workers who built that track here at the commemoration ceremony marking the completion of the transcontinental train in 1869, this photograph taken near Salt Lake City, Utah. Two protagonists, one of them a charter member of the preposterously rich Gilded Age class of robber barons. The other, a bedraggled, eccentric artist. Two people who had a friendship and a collaboration, most unlikely, that produced moving pictures. There's a third character in this plot. This was the gun owned by every man west of the Mississippi, a Smith and Wesson number two revolver in the period 1860 to 1880, a gun owned by one of those two men I introduce you to, who happens to have been a murderer, but you're not interested in that. <laughs> the story begins 
in this modest bungalow. <laughs> San Francisco, January 1880. On the top of California Hill, now called Knob Hill, for all of the nabobs who moved there. This was the home of Leland Stanford, former governor of California, head of the railroad, which made him the richest man west of the Mississippi. 50 rooms, 50,000 square feet, a house built in 1876. Three people lived in that house. Stanford, his wife Jane Lathrop, their son, Leland Stanford, Jr., along with 15 live-in servants. It was the kind of house where they favored a modest style of decoration. <laughs> it was the kind of house where the rooms had names. This was the so-called Pompeian room, named because the decorator told the Stanfords that the iconography he was using on the walls and in the selection of furniture represented some of the materials that had been excavated beneath the ash at Pompeii some decade and a half earlier. It was in this room that Edward Muybridge, 10 years now a friend of the Stanfords, arrived on a night in January to entertain a party the Stanfords were having. They had invited some of their other rich friends, silver magnates, bank presidents. They had invited the senator from New York, the governor of California, a tuxedo-clad crowd. And the entertainment was Muybridge and his apparatus. He had brought a machine that he had built, a projector that he called a zoopraxiscope, which was to project moving images on a screen for the first time. Muybridge had been hired by Stanford to photograph his, Stanford's horses, in stop motion, which he did. These were some of the first images that Muybridge took, arresting the gallop of Stanford's horses. And that night, in January, he projected them in sequence, in rapid sequence, on the wall to the astonishment of the people who were there gathered. This was Stanford's horse, Sally, I want to say Sally May. Sally, hmm, I can't remember Sally's last name. Stanford was fascinated by a question of the horse's gait, which was, does the animal ever leave the ground during a gallop? And he'd hired his friend Moybridge to answer that question. And it was out of these experiments that Moybridge created the foundation for movies. And in that way, also the foundation for, in my opinion, the culture of the moving image, which we are all immersed in day after day, this world in which we fall silent in the presence of a, a moving picture. We are mesmerized by it, and we can't take our eyes off of it until it stops. This society that we live in today, I think, had its roots in that mansion in California. So, Edward Moybridge, born in 1880, 1830, in Kingston, England, southwest of London, 10 miles southwest. His father, his mother's family, rather, were uh, owners of a, a barging operation that ran uh, food and furniture into London, which was 25 miles away down river on the Thames. Mybridge was not of the class of men who were uh, admitted to higher education. Only one in 100 men at that time went on to university at Cambridge or Oxford, let alone women. And Moybridge, like the great majority of uh, people from the merchant class, finished his education at age 16 and then became an apprentice, in this case to a printer in London, a printer who was also 
a, a bookseller and a publisher named the London Printing and Publishing Company. Myridge learned the trade of bookselling. Now, he was a person who had a problem with names. He was born Edward Muggeridge, and he changed his name five times. <laughs> when he came to America at age 20, he became Ted Muggridge. He came to New York. When he moved to California at age 25, he became Edward Moygridge. A couple of years later, he changed the consonant in his surname to a B, became Edward Moybridge. And then, when he became an artist and a photographer, he chose the prerogative of artists to use a single name, and he called himself Helios. <laughs> the god of the sun. That lasted for three or four years. And finally, he chose the name Edvird Moybridge. Edvird being the medieval spelling in English of Edward. And that's the name by which he's known to art history, to film history. That's how you'll find him in encyclopedia listings. This is the way he looked for most of his life. He had a beard typically down to the middle of his chest, which he rarely combed. He was a man who wore pants with strings on the cuffs. He lived out of a, uh, a duffel bag for much of his adult life. He was a bookseller in New York, which is not a bad way to make a living there at the time in the 1850s. He immigrated to New York at age 20 in 1850. At the time, there were 200 libraries in New York, a lot of people who bought books. But there was something going on at the time as well, which was a rage for California, the gold rush had erupted in 1849. Tens of thousands of young men were moving from the East Coast to California to dig for gold. Myridge did not want to dig for gold, but he was caught up in the fantasy of westward expansion. He went to California in 1855, still as a bookseller. The problem was San Francisco had one library compared to New York's 200. It was a hard living. This is what San Francisco looked like after 12 years on the ground. It was the uh, paradigmatic boom town. Moybridge moved to this street, Montgomery Street, just off of the harbor, just off of the bay, rather. The second to last street running along San Francisco Bay. And he lived and worked in one of those buildings on the west side of the street, on that side of the photograph, selling fine art books, selling encyclopedias, selling uh, thick uh, anthologies of British literature. But in his 30s, he took very different direction. He became fascinated by photography. And he decided that he would learn the art of the photographer, which was a very painstaking art. It wasn't a, uh, a business of um, snapshot, uh, instantaneous image making, as we have now, or even as developed some decades later. At the time, so he was 37 when he decided to do this, to, to change careers. At the time, the bread and butter of photography was portraiture, as it remains. You were, wanted to make a living. You brought people into a studio. You photographed them. You sold them prints of, of their own image. But Moybridge was 
an eccentric man. He wasn't very good with people. Um, he was alienating to people. So he decided he would photograph people's possessions, their houses, their animals. And he started his work working for the small successes of the California business class. Families like this who had immigrated and gotten together a bit of capital and built themselves a house. But you see, he should have put this family on the porch and shown off their property. Instead, he put them in the paddock with the horse manure and obscured their belongings. He was not good with people. <laughs> However, <clears throat> he was fascinated by the greatness and the grandeur of the West. He took himself to Yosemite Valley in 1866 that seven-mile-long gash in central California with its tissue veil waterfalls, its sheer rock faces. This was a valley that had been visited by only about 300 white people by this time, intrepid folks who didn't mind living in a mule cart. It was a valley that was occupied by native people. But Moybridge took himself there, following the footsteps of an, another photographer named Carlton Watkins, and decided that he was going to make the signature images of Yosemite Valley, which he recognized to be an icon waiting for publicity. And he took some of the most beautiful and suggestive images of that place, which sold madly around the US, on the East Coast in particular, and in Europe, and very quickly helped to promote Yosemite into the image of American openness and expansion American majesty, the, the notion of the West that we now take for granted, emerged from Moybridge's photographs, which circulated widely, won him prizes, and made him, after only two years as a photographer, into one of the best known image makers in the country. He took a camera of this kind. It was a stereoscope camera. The other way to make a living as a photographer was to take stereo images. You've all seen them. They're about eight inches long, four inches tall. There are two pictures side by side on them. You put them in a viewer, hold it up to your eyes, and looking through a pair of lenses, you see a 3D image. This was the first 3D image. Stereoscope photography became faddish in the 1860s. Every middle class house had a viewer on the parlor table and a collection of 100 or 200 uh, images. So what was the best kind of Seen for a stereo viewer, <coughs> landscapes, especially deep space landscapes. So he brought a camera like this and sold thousands and thousands of stereoscope views of Yosemite. So things went well for him now. He's nearly 40 years old. This is the dark room at Yosemite. This is the tent in which he would develop his work. The style of photography was called wet plate photography. There was no celluloid on which emulsion was spread. 
There was a piece of glass, 8 by 10. You took it inside this tent, and you took this material called collodion. It was also called collodion photography. Collodion was a flammable, gelatinous mess that you would pour on the glass plate. It had the consistency of maple syrup, but it was clear. You would tilt the glass plate in the dark until it was covered with this sticky stuff. Then you would plunge the plate into a bath of uh, silver nitrate, which is the material that, uh, the light sensitive material that makes the photographic negative. And still in the dark, you mounted this into the back of a large camera. Then you finally took it out, put it on a tripod, and you were ready to take one image. The image was not shuttered. There was a lens cap. You took the lens cap off. You counted 1,001, 1,002. You put the lens cap back on. Then you took this plate back into the dark room and developed it. It had to be developed within 10 minutes. Otherwise, the image would disintegrate. This was the technology of photography of that day, the, the technology that he used his whole life. It was a very cumbersome technology. It required a mule cart to carry all of the gear up and down the mountain. Now, you might notice that down here, he has scratched onto the plate his name, Helios, just so that you would know who the author of this photograph is. Edward Moybridge asked one of his assistants at Yosemite to photograph him sitting on this precipice looking down at a 2,000-foot drop. This picture would come back to haunt him. It would come back to serve as evidence of his insanity <laughs> at the murder trial. Leland Stanford, born in 1824, near Albany, son of farmers, five brothers. He was the brother that his parents chose to give the best education they could afford. The other brothers did not get that education. Stanford was sent to two or three academies in upstate New York in Oneida County. He emerged with something like a higher education. Then he went to Albany and apprenticed as a lawyer. He was a handsome young man. Seems to have modeled his appearance after Abraham Lincoln. And he went to work as a lawyer briefly in Albany. But then he, too, in the late 1840s, caught the Western fever, he moved halfway west to Wisconsin, to Lake Michigan, to a small town north of Chicago, practiced as a solo attorney there, found himself bored. He went back to Albany, married his schoolyard, schoolyard sweetheart, Jane Lathrop, who was from a family higher place than Stanford's own, the daughter of a family of ministers and accountants. Now, why they were ministers on the one hand and accountants on the other, I'm not sure. <laughs> they moved back to Wisconsin. And by this time, 1849, 1850, Stanford's four brothers had all moved to California. And they were writing him letters saying, Leland, you must come out here. We're making a lot of money. The brothers were smart. They, op they opened shops that sold to gold rush migrants. They didn't pan for gold themselves. They ran these little tent operations that sold food and equipment to miners. So Stanford, after a fire in his office, burned his law library. 
decided that he was going to pitch it in and go west and go rugged. He brought Jane, his wife, back to Albany against her wishes, asked her to stay in Albany while he went to California for three years and tried to make some money. He went to the Sierra Mountains where the mining fever was high. He opened a store of his own. Here is Smith and Stanford, the store that sold pickaxes and pans and canned food and tents to the tens of thousands of miners swarming the hills. You may notice that here is a sign on the front of Stanford's store in Cantonese. That was because a quarter of the miners were immigrants from Canton province and their money was as good as anyone's. He did quickly make money, and he saved it. He went back to Albany, retrieved his wife, Jane. Now, to go back and forth to California to the East Coast was no easy matter. It took six weeks on a stagecoach, if you were lucky. It took four weeks if you took the shortcut, which was from New York by steamer to Nicaragua, by mule train over the mountains of Nicaragua, another steamer from Nicaragua to San Francisco. Lucky if you didn't get fever. Or it took five weeks if you went around the Horn, all the way down to the bottom of South America. Stanford retrieved Jane, they moved to Sacramento. This was the capital city of California, population 12,000 in 1855. San Francisco was population 100,000. This was the main street of Sacramento, and Stanford opened a new shop right about here. He became principally a grocer, a small town rich man on the frontier. When he opened his shop, it happened to have been next door to a hardware shop called Huntington and Hopkins. Stanford's shop was over here, owned by Collis Huntington and Mark Hopkins, two other small town rich men. They in turn had another friend named Charles Crocker, who was another prosperous businessman. And so this bunch of merchants was pretty happy until comes to town a fast-talking salesman named Theodore Judah with this rakish hat and a nervous manner. Judah was obsessed with one thing. He wanted to sell the idea of building a train that went from San Francisco back across the Mississippi to at least Missouri. And he went and he had designed some short lines of 25 miles or 40 miles near Buffalo. And he'd gone to California to try to become the linchpin in this majestic new project. He went to these rich shopkeepers and said, if you loan me two or three thousand dollars, I'll go up in the Sierra, I'll survey the route that would allow a train to go into the mountains over to the other side, and then we can sell it to Washington. Stanford and his friends Huntington, Hopkins, Crocker loaned invested some handful of thousand dollars in this idea, and they were off and running. This is Mr. Stanford in his house in Sacramento, the nicest house in town, on the porch next to Jane, about 1860. They had done quite well for themselves. So 1860, Stanford has gotten into politics. He's run for a couple of offices, hasn't won. <clears throat> but something fortuitous happens in 1860. 
Abraham Lincoln is elected, which causes a couple of things to take place. It turns California from a Democrat into a Republican state. The Republicans were the relatively new anti-slavery business, pro-business party. The Democrats were the somewhat older pro-slavery um, populist white party. And Stanford runs for governor, and he wins. What else happens? Abraham Lincoln is elected. The South secedes. Previously, Congress had entertained the idea of funding, of subsidizing the construction of a railroad. But no one in Congress could agree on where it would go. The northern <coughs> congressman wanted it to go from Chicago to San Francisco. The southern congressman wanted it to go from Los Angeles to New Orleans. So nothing happened for 10 years. The South secedes. All of the senators and representatives from the southern states leave Washington to go work for the Confederacy, leaving a consensus of northern representatives in Washington. Stanford and Judah arrive in town with their survey. They pitch it to Congress. Abraham Lincoln happens to be a former railroad lawyer who worked for the railroads. He's a railroad booster. A law passes that will subsidize construction of this enormous public project. And suddenly, these four men, Hopkins, Huntington, Crocker, and Stanford, are the golden boys of the Western states. They return to California. Construction begins in 1862. And as we all know, it was largely done by Chinese immigrants. Some 25,000 immigrants from southern China. Here is a photograph of a handful of Chinese workers and their overseer riding on a train full of rock that had been quarried and blasted and chipped out of this crevice as one one thousandth of the project of building the railroad. The railroad is finished in 1869. Stanford and his partners become preposterously wealthy. And one year, Jane Stanford gives her husband a private railroad car for his birthday. This is the car, the private car, in which they would travel for the rest of their lives, the Stanford car that crisscrossed the country. They lived in it for months at a time, along with living in that house that they built on California Hill. Jane Lathrop, she has one son who was born when she was 38 or 39 years old, Leland Jr. <clears throat> she pampers him. He's raised like a princeling. She pampers herself, and she begins to collect diamonds. One year, she hires an artist to paint her diamond collection. And this painting, which survives, is the size of a double bed. And it still hangs in the art gallery at Stanford University. Stanford is a hero, briefly, for having built the railroad. He's regarded as a savior by all of California. But briefly, within two years, Californians realize the railroad has now a monopoly grip on their everyday life. It can charge freight rates whatever it pleases to do. If the price of wheat goes up, the freight rate goes up. And companies are being put out of business. Stanford and his friends acquire a nickname, which is the octopus. This is a cartoon that shows Stanford in the right eye of an octopus. 
Charles Crocker, one of his partners in the left eye, and the tentacles gripping a shipping company, gripping farmers down here, gripping a stagecoach company, killing workers who had resisted the landlords of the railroad company here, and shoveling bags of money at, at City Hall to bribe politicians to get laws favorable to them. So a hero and then a villain within a matter of 18 months. Stanford builds that house on California Hill. His friends follow him up the hill, and they each buy one block square plots and build their own houses. And there was one episode during that real estate gold rush that bears mentioning. <clears throat> Charles Crocker wanted to have a house on a block square, but there was one man who would not sell. There was one man who had a house this size, and he would not sell. So Crocker built his house and then built a wall that surrounded that man's house, 40-foot wall, cutting out its light and air, a wall that came within two feet of the windows of the house, completely cutting out its light and air, making it in uninhabitable. This was called the spite fence. And it became an emblem in San Francisco for what many people, ordinary folks, believe to be the avarice and overweening power of the big four, these four men who controlled this railroad monopoly. It was a tourist attraction. People would take the trolley up the hill just to look at the spite fence, which stood for some 30 years. The family inside the house moved out, but they continued to defy by not selling and not turning over their deed to Mr. Crocker. Stanford <clears throat> becomes a collector of horses. He buys 10,000 acres south of San Francisco, and he names it Palo Alto. There, he begins to gather in an extraordinary collection of standard breads and thoroughbreds, and he becomes a connoisseur of horsemanship. He becomes, in his own view, a kind of equestrian philosopher. He would spend days watching, sitting on a swivel chair in the center of a track, watching his horses <coughs> run around the track, training and training. He develops his own theories of diet and theories of training and how to exercise horses to, so as to make them more competitive. He begins to enter his horses into races, and they win race after race after race. It's a curious irony because he's, of course, at the head of this new transportation network, which has made this 10,000-year-old form of transportation rapidly obsolete. He's putting horses out of business, if you like. In any case, he's fascinated by a question that perturbs him and other people like him. There's only a rarefied group of horse connoisseurs, such as the Vanderbilts on the East Coast, with whom Stanford compares his own family and, and lifestyle, who ask themselves questions like this. Do the hooves of a horse ever leave the ground during a gallop? It was the theory known as unsupported transit. Do horses fly? The naked eye can't see whether horses fly. Some people thought they did. Others thought that the horse always had one hoof on the ground. And artists traditionally represented horses in a gallop with their front legs extended forward and their back legs extended rearward. Stanford thought this was ridiculous. There's no horse that moves that way. And so, how can I answer this question? This is the sort of thing he began to ask himself at his horse farm in Palo Alto. This is a, an aerial shot taken by Balloon of the paddocks and the stable 
the main stable at Palo Alto. Stanford's country house is somewhere over here. And the horses were exercised here, and there's a track over there. How can I answer this question? He hires a painter to depict a horse in the stride that he believes a horse takes. And then he turns to his friend, Edward Moybridge. This is Mr. Stanford, a polished man. His personality is phlegmatic. Everyone describes him as a nearly wordless conversationalist. You could stand in his company, and he would utter two words in 10 minutes. Highly polished, he loved to wear tuxedos at home. He had his silk top hats, a silver-tipped cane, his 10,000 workers in the train line addressed him as Governor Stanford. He was governor for two years, and they doffed their hats whenever they saw him. He was a man who commanded deference. His friend of 10 years, <coughs> Edward Mybridge, the photographer, the landscape photographer. Here he is at the base of one of the great sequoias in the lower part of Yosemite Valley. The man who lived out of a bag, who never combed his hair, who had holes in his hat, washed his clothes once a month. Curious companion for this other man. But somehow they became friends when Stanford asked Moybridge to photograph his house in Sacramento, the house we saw earlier, the one he sat in front of with his wife. This house, you can still visit it. It's part of the state park system in Sacramento. Edward Moybridge took this photograph and photographed the interior of the house. Interestingly, people are not present in any of these photographs, only things, things, things. Stanford liked them well enough, and he began to spend evenings chatting with Moybridge. They talked about travel. They talked about horses at Stanford's insistence, and Stanford said, would you please help me to answer this question? Can you arrest the gallop of a horse? So Moybridge tries. He brings his camera out <clears throat> to the track. He tries. He gets a blurry image. He tries again. He gets another blurry image. This is 1872, 1873. He's not getting anywhere. And then something happens in his life. He meets a woman, Moybridge meets a woman, at the gallery that sells his photographs, a woman named Flora Downs. She's a photo retoucher. She paints repairs on the surface of the negative where there's a scratch. And Moybridge is fascinated by her. He is 40 years old, never been married, there's no evidence in his papers that I found of relationships that he'd had before. She's 20 years old. Inconveniently, she's married. He asks her, may I photograph you? She says, yes. They go up to one of the petrified forests near Napa, and he photographs her. They take several trips together and he photographs her. Moybridge helps her to find a lawyer to get a divorce. She divorces. She marries Moybridge, who's twice her age. Moybridge, who's got money, but no place to live, rents a townhouse in a ritzy new neighborhood in San Francisco, and they move in. It's the nicest place he's ever lived. She gets pregnant. He takes her photograph posed by a bushel of pears, which resemble the shape that her body is acquiring during her pregnancy. 
This is a stereograph, by the way. You put it in a viewer, you would see the rounded shape of her, her body in 3D. But Moybridge is not an attentive husband. She's a young woman. She likes the theater. She likes her friends. She likes to buy stuff. Moybridge has got money. She's spending his money. She likes to go out. He likes to stay at home. He likes to travel. He travels a lot for his work to Alaska. He travels to the coast to photograph lighthouses for the government. He travels inland a bit to photograph Native Americans. He ignores her in her view. She begins a love affair with a journalist named Harry Larkins, who's a handsome, soft-spoken, beautifully dressed man who had just arrived from London. I don't have a photograph of Harry Larkins, but all of the descriptions of him are of a man whose polish and loveliness are in stark contrast to that of Moybridge himself. They have a love affair that goes on for a year. Moybridge comes home. He finds evidence <clears throat> that not only is his wife having a love affair, but the boy that's been born to them, he thinks, is not his own son. I told you, didn't I not, that Moybridge had a problem with names? They named their son Florado, <laughs> which was an amalgam of his mother's name, Flora, and the name Edward in Spanish, Eduardo. Florado. Moybridge comes home. He finds a picture of Florado, who's 18 months old. He's not taken this photograph himself. Somebody else has. He turns it over. He finds an inscription on it that says, our boy, love Harry. He goes into a fugue. He hyperventilates. He is alone. His wife is out for the day. He goes to get his gun. He goes to the house where Harry Larkins is staying. He pounds on the door. Larkins answers the door. And Moybridge says, I have a message to you about my wife. And he shoots him dead in the doorway. Inside this house, there are seven witnesses. Moybridge is arrested, arraigned. He confesses to the crime. To the newspaper, he confesses to the crime. There are seven eyewitnesses. He's prosecuted in Napa, a town of 3,000 where near which he had taken advantage of Larkins' uh, unawareness to commit the murder. And there's a sensational trial in this tiny town in Central California, a national event, this trial. Why? Well, Moybridge is the best known photographer in the West, and he's the personal photographer of the most important man in the West. Thirdly, there's the telegraph. The lines of the telegraph have been arrayed alongside all the railroad tracks in the country. And so reporters in the courtroom would run out to the Western Union office and send a dispatch, which would then go to by telegraph to San Francisco and from there across the country. So if you were in Baltimore or Cleveland or Chicago or Washington, D.C. or Boston or New Orleans in January 1875, you would be reading about this trial. 
So it was a, one of the first national media sensations. <coughs> Marbridge's defense, his lawyer, procured for him by Leland Stanford, advocates an insanity defense. Marbridge, you have to plead that you were mad. Here's the photograph of, that you're sitting on the edge of the mountain. You're about to fall off. This shows a jury that you were mad. The lawyer, his name is Pentagast, lines up a bunch of witnesses to testify to Marbridge's madness over Marbridge's protest. But it turns out there was no need for that. The jury found him not guilty on the basis of justifiable homicide. Justifiable homicide, a common law defense, also known as the provocation defense. Typically, someone threatens you with a weapon. The provocation defense is you have the right to respond with deadly force. Distorted in the minds of jealous husbands, this becomes your wife is sleeping with another man. That is sufficient provocation to give you license to kill. It was the refuge of hundreds of jealous husbands who committed the crime of murder during the 19th century and well into the 20th century. The judge in the Moybridge trial instructed the jury, now mind you, all the jury are men, and Moybridge's lawyer has made a point that all of the jury are married men. The judge instructs the jury, do not acquit this man because you sympathize with him as a wronged husband. Judge the crime. The jury returns a unanimous verdict of not guilty, which happened over and over, by the way. Now, I combed the legal records looking for a wife who had used this defense successfully. I couldn't find it. I never found a woman who was able to find an acquittal when she killed her sexual rival. But there are many men who did this. Moybridge emerges from this trial more famous than before, a man with public sympathy for what has happened to him. His wife, well, you're not interested in his wife. I'll tell you about her. <clears throat> his wife, she's 23. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the fact that her husband had killed her lover, she did not take it well. <laughs> she holds it against him. She sues him for divorce. A divorce is granted. She sues him for alimony. Alimony is granted. She becomes a single mom, raising Florado. And then, at age 24, Six months after the trial, she contracts typhoid fever and dies. Florado is initially placed with another family, not with Moybridge. And then Moybridge places Florado, whom he believes is not his son, in an orphanage and visits him from time to time. It's a sad story. Meanwhile, back in Palo Alto, Stanford has built a second mansion at his horse farm. Here he's commissioned a painter to depict the great ease and luxury and familial idyll that he has devised for himself. Mr. Stanford his wife Jane, their son Leland Stanford Jr., some in-laws, some servants, 
some croquet. Stanford says, Moybridge, don't worry about that murder. It's all right, I understand. Come back and work for me. Let's solve this horse problem once and for all. I'll give you $50,000, which is a million dollars in today's money. Moybridge comes to Palo Alto, he builds a shed in front of one of Stanford's tracks. He puts 24 cameras in it, side by side. He builds a tilted white wall to reflect sun onto the track. He scatters white sand on the track. He instructs the jockeys to run the horses at a gallop this way so that he can photograph them 24 times. The first way that it works, he's tied strings from each camera across the track. The horse breaks the string, exposes one picture, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. But strings being strings, they're going off irregularly. So he builds an electromagnet that can, with <clears throat> electrical signals, fire off each shutter. By now, he's using shutters, not just lens caps, in exact uh, intermittent steps of a tenth of a second. So that 24 photographs will cover nearly two seconds. And he achieves these remarkable first images of Occident, Stanford's favorite trotter, who has won a lot of races by this point. And you may see that Occident is off of the ground in this photograph, and off of the ground in this photograph, proving the theory of unsupported transit. But that's not quite enough. Moybridge says, why don't I animate these pictures? There have been projected animations before this point, but only of drawings. There are flip books, and there's a device called the praxinoscope, which is devised by a Frenchman that projects drawings that have been drawn um, with uh, such things as a dancing couple in intermittent steps, and these images are projected on the wall or on a screen, but nobody's projected photographs before. He, he uh, adapts a, a magic lantern, which is a slide projector of the day, to take a disc the size of a dinner plate. He arrays photographs around the edge of the disc, and he projects things on the wall. You may notice that these men, <laughs> you may have noticed that these men are naked. What's going on here? Moybridge photographs Stanford's horses by the dozen. Then he begins to invite athletes, acrobats, blacksmiths down to Palo Alto so he can photograph people in motion. By the way, this is Leland Stanford Jr. photographed by Moybridge on the boy's pony running along one of the Moybridge tracks that's been numbered. Athletes, he invites, to tumble, to do flips, to box. And increasingly, he asks them to take off their clothes. Beautiful things, huh? The traditional birth date for the invention of the movies is 1895. That was the year that a pair of French brothers, Louis and Auguste Lumiere, built a device they call the cinematograph, which was a box 12 inches by 8 by 8 
in which they put a strip of celluloid, very long, that they ran behind a lens. And after developing that, turned this machine into a projector uh, that projected images. The traditional birth date is 1895, but Mybridge, 15 years earlier, is making things that are remarkably, remarkably like moving pictures that we think of as the very first cinema. Moybridge photographs himself climbing stairs, shoveling dirt, gravel, swinging a pickaxe. He's not ashamed. And why all these nude photographs? He begins to conceive of himself as an anatomist and a scientist who is involved in something that he calls motion studies. He was indeed interested in the movements of a horse. He wanted to analyze them for his patron, Stanford. Why can't we do the same for people? Then we would learn more about the human anatomy. And artists, he's reasoning, will be able to depict the human anatomy more accurately than ever. And so many, many nude photographs of people in everyday acts of cleaning, of dressing, of running. However, however, to our eyes, there was an unmistakable prurient content to Moybridge's motion studies. Stanford and Moybridge have a falling out. When Moybridge first photographs the horses, he becomes nearly a household name in America. He tours Europe, speaking to all the scientific societies, as well as all of the important museums and art institutes, curiously crossing the line back and forth between science and art, depicting himself as an artist to one audience and as a scientist to another. Stanford dislikes this. Stanford is accustomed to being the big man. He takes 100 of Moybridge's photographs and publishes them in a book with his own name on it, minus Moybridge's name, causing constant shame for Moybridge, who's very proud of his work. Moybridge sues his old friend. Stanford is, in fact, still the big man. He wins the lawsuit. Their friendship is broken. They never see each other again. Moybridge needs a new patron who will allow him to continue this work. He finds it in the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And he moves in 1882 to Philadelphia and does hundreds and hundreds of nude motion studies. And the people who run the University of Philadelphia are very nervous about all of the nakedness. He ends up with 781 motion studies, half of them of nude women and some men. The university considers whether to withdraw its support, but finally goes ahead and publishes these in book form. There is some upset in the press, but they're circulating, these images are circulating not with pornography. There is an underground economy in pornography. They're circulating on the tabletops of scientists and anatomists. The New York Times writes a review of this University of Pennsylvania tome saying, the publishers are taking care to see that the pictures do not fall into the wrong hands. Moybridge becomes a traveling showman. 
He crisscrosses the country with his device, his zoopraxiscope, as he calls it, showing off his moving images to audiences all over the place. I'm sure he, he came to Cleveland. I, I don't know what the leading ins institute of art at the time was there. Here he is in Chicago at the 1893 World's Fair. He has his own pavilion where he is a master showman. What does he call it? Zoopraxographical Hall. <coughs> Meanwhile, Leland Stanford Jr., raised as an American prince, in his early teens, he becomes a collector of antiquities. On several trips to the Mediterranean, he acquires numerous figures <clears throat> from art dealers who purport to be selling him Roman and Egyptian antiquities. And on one of these trips, at age 15, he's traveling with his mother and father. In Florence, he contracts a fever, and he dies. His parents' only child. They fall into a fugue of grief, delirious grief. They begin to consult psychics who will put them in touch with Leland Jr. For months, they conduct seances. This is a very popular thing at the time, right? Spiritualism. Seances with which they are deluded by the spiritualist that they are receiving messages from their dead son. When they emerge from this season of despair, they decide that they will do something concrete to memorialize their boy. They will found a university. And they will call it Leland Stanford Junior University. And they will put it on the lawn in front of their house in Palo Alto. This is the Stanford party scene in the years after the death of their son. This is Mr. Stanford on the lawn in front of their Palo Alto cottage. This is Rutherford B. Hayes, President of the United States. And over here is a man called William Tecumseh Sherman, the Union general who burned Atlanta in the march to the sea. Personal friend of Mr. Stanford, the Republican politician. <clears throat> the kind of company they kept. Stanford University would rise within 100 yards of this porch. And so it did. In 1893, it opened. Stanford cut the ribbon, made a speech. Six months later, he died. Mario Bridge is crisscrossing the country. And one day, in West Orange, New Jersey, He's giving a talk at the local library there, showing his zoopraxiscope and his moving pictures. Most famous son of West Orange, New Jersey, is Thomas Edison, whose Edison company employs 100 people in a factory there. Edison is 40 years old. His invention of the phonograph has made him a household name. He is another charter member of the one-tenth of one percent elite. He has established the Edison uh, utility that is now delivering electricity to 10,000 homes of, of people who are willing to take the risk. He's improved the light bulb. And he is patenting inventions at a marvelous clip. There's no evidence that he attended this talk of Marbridge, but the Monday after the talk, he asked Marbridge to come see him in his office. Marbridge did. Edison and Marbridge sit across the desk from one another, and 
Edison says, Marwich, tell me how you did it. Tell me what you've done to make these images. I've got my phonograph. You've got your moving pictures. We should collaborate. We can make moving pictures with sound. Now, this much is known because both of these men said, told that same story to reporters for the New York papers about this meeting and about their thought to collaborate. Marwich goes home. He sends his work to Edison. Edison assigns five engineers to a team to devise a camera that will do what Marwich has done, but do it better. <clears throat> One of the engineers he assigns is a man called Fred Ott. Now, Edison has the good fortune that a new material has just been invented called celluloid. And by the way, after this meeting, Muybridge sends Edison letter after letter saying, I thought we were going to collaborate. Edison ignores letter after letter. They never speak again. Edison was famous even in his lifetime, at least among engineers, for borrowing other people's ideas and not returning them. <laughs> Celluloid has just been invented, not by a photographer. <clears throat> it's being used in the collars of men's uh, shirts or in the cuffs. It's being used in hairbrushes. It's this uh, synthetic goo that um, nobody can quite figure out how to maximize. George Eastman in Rochester, New York, establishes a company called Kodak. He realizes that he can spread light-sensitive emulsion on this celluloid stuff, and it would be a carrier for the photographic image that is superior to glass. And it works. That same year, Fred Ott and another engineer on the team, Dixon, William Dixon, decide maybe we can get long strips of celluloid, paint it with, with uh, emulsion, and run it through, run it in front of a lens, and we'll have hundreds and hundreds of images instead of Marbridge's 24. And there we can make moving images that will last 30 seconds or a minute and not two seconds. Fred Ott, the first Edison film made, at least by legend, is called Fred Ott's Sneeze. There you have it. <laughs> Library of Congress. Download it. Edison builds a primitive film studio in the back of his factory. It's known as the Black Mariah, nicknamed that because the engineers say it looks like a paddy wagon. It has a retractable roof that opens like a tabletop to admit sun. There's a stage inside. The camera is over here. And Edison and his team invite acrobats, blacksmiths, boxers, dancers to come out to West Orange to film for a few seconds on the stage in the Black Mariah for a small fee. And curiously, these are the same sorts of things that Moiridge pioneered, except Edison's subjects are all clothed. <laughs> they build something called the kinetoscope, which is the first projector used in commercial film distribution. It's about this tall. You peer into it through an eyepiece. The celluloid film, which is about 60 seconds long, runs 
past your eyes, after you've dropped in 25 cents, that is. And Edison establishes a string of hundreds of kinetoscope parlors around the US. And for the first time, hundreds of thousands of people are looking at movies in public. They come in, they look into this viewer, they put in their money, and they get a dancer. They get a boxing scene. Edison has a genius for developing a product and for developing a distribution system. Moybridge does not. He's advertising for his new device. And although we don't think of Edison in this way, <clears throat> between the years 1895, when the, the first kinetoscope uh, parlor opens, I think it's 1894, until 1917, a period of 23 years, Edison is the first magnate of film production. He is the monopolist of American film production. He is taking to court, he is suing anyone who will try to make movies and distribute them in any way, claiming that he has the patent ownership of moving picture technology. And he's winning these lawsuits. And he becomes, his name becomes synonymous with the early film industry, in the same way that Metro Golden Mayer would later. We don't think of him that way. But in 1917, he, he loses a major lawsuit in the Supreme Court, which strips him of this uh, alleged um, patent uh, privilege. And he gets out of the business. But before that, this is one of the Edison studios in Bronx, New York. He's making hundreds and hundreds of 15-minute short reels. Meanwhile, we're coming to the end now. Boyavridge is watching all this from afar. He's an old man. He's a superannuated old man. He, he's out of date. He still has his little two-second projection system. He is unable to partner with Edison. He knows that history has passed him by, that he lost his main chance. He moves home to Kingston, where he was born. He has lived in the United States for 50 years at this point. He moves home to Kingston at age 70. He's got some money. He buys a house. He gardens. The crest of his success was his appearance at the World's Fair in Chicago. It seems that he became enamored of Lake Michigan. His garden is designed in the shape of the Great Lakes. His backyard has the five Great Lakes. He spends his days <clears throat> putting a bank on Lake Erie and a hedge around Lake Michigan. Fifty years pass after this, 1975. Marbridge is long dead. The current owners of that house are digging up the garden, and they find this destroyed, damaged, distressed image that Moiridge had buried in a peak under his Great Lakes, the first, very first image of Occident, Stanford's horse, that he had arrested in motion, buried almost as a kind of talisman. Moiridge dies. 1904, age 74. A year later, the first motion picture theater opens in Pittsburgh. Until that time, movies were short features shown before vaudeville shows or music hall shows. They were the teaser. The first dedicated film theater opens in Pittsburgh in 1905, and then thousands in its wake in the film industry becomes what we know it to be.
Marbridge was an artist. He was a photographer. He was not a businessman. And that is the sad crux of his story. Thank you very much. I hope there are questions. Yes? No? Um, I'm wondering, what, what uh, interested you, and how did you first get the idea on this book, for this story? Well, years ago, I was um, in graduate school in film studies, mm -hmm. interested in film history. So I'd known about this Moybridge story, and I didn't ultimately uh, become a film scholar. I did something, I became a journalist. I hadn't forgotten. But I've known about this Moybridge uh, life history, life story for a long time. And I've also known that he was a murderer. Whereas in um, film circles, in art history circles, he's a well-known name. But his crime is not so well known. I thought it would be interesting to combine the history of film with this murder story and see if they fit together. So it was actually a, a file folder in the drawer that came out after 20 years. <clears throat> Other questions? I was just curious about your research project. You've covered so many subjects, so many areas. How long did it take you, and how did you approach doing the research and then bringing it all together? Yeah, it took longer than it should have. Um, fortunately, these two characters left major archival material behind in Stanford's case. His papers are at Stanford University, along with lots of Moybridge's work. Moybridge's materials are also in Philadelphia. They're in London. They're in his hometown of Kingston. They're at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So I went from archive to archive, which is what historians do. Uh, the, the real labor was constructing the story in um, narrative form. And, that's where the, the hard part was. The easy part is reading. But uh, trying to figure out who these people were, that was the hard part. The rustling you're hearing is evaluation forms and pencils being sent, sent around. Other questions? Now, come on. Somebody's got to have a question for him. Is it still called Leland Stanford University? Yes. It's still called Leland Stanford Junior University. He was a senator at the end of his life. That's correct, yeah. You got one over here? Yeah. Do you have any information on whatever happened to the baby that the wife had? The boy. The boy, yeah. Yeah. Florado. Florado was raised in the San Francisco orphanage. His father, Moybridge, visited him once a year until age 12 and then stopped visiting him. And uh, he, Florado, nevertheless told anyone he met that his father was the famous photographer, Edward Moybridge. He had a simple life. He went on to be a hostler, a, ho a horse handler, curiously, at ranches in Central California. He seems never to have married. He lived until 1940. Wow. When, at age 70, he stepped out into a street and was hit by a car and killed. So his, his life seems nearly not at all to have intersected with his father's life. Other questions? 
You guys are all busy writing. Did Stanford buy his senatorship? He uh, is is uh, alleged to have um, paid representatives in the California State House. This was the time before senators were popularly elected, right? Yeah. And so state houses of uh, representatives elected <coughs> their uh, representatives. And Stanford is alleged to have uh, bribed um, people to vote him in. But there was no paper trail that I could find. Back to Florado. Um, is there any images of him? Did he resemble There's Mybridge? one image, yeah, Mybridge. and he resembles Moybridge. Yeah, there's one image. I don't remember if I've got it in the book, um, but he does resemble Moybridge, yeah. More questions? Okay, now I'm going to... Oh, go ahead. Have you been to uh, Milan or as we call it here in Ohio, Milan, Ohio, which is the birthplace of Thomas Edison, and there's an Edison museum there, and much Edison adulation. Yeah. In no, Milan. I haven't been to Milan. <laughs> yeah. No, it's I not haven't. very far from here. You should have a peek. Take yeah. it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions? Well, then I'm going to pick on somebody, so forgive me. Mrs. Ball, would you please stand up? Mr. Ball, I want you to meet one of your cousins from Hudson, Ohio. Hello. Hi. Thank you, ladies. I would remind you that he wrote a wonderful book called Slaves in the Family. If you haven't read it already, please do so. It's all about the Ball family history. Other questions? Then I'm going to say one more time, thank you from Hudson, Ohio, and all of you hopefully will join me. And he will go to the back of the room and sign some books and answer some independent questions. If you buy a book, I will sign it. <laughs> <laughs>